KSN News takes us on an exclusive behind the scenes look at conditions at El Dorado Prison. Plus, the governor hands down her first veto with warnings of major budget trouble if lawmakers override her. And two top leaders of the KHP suddenly gone amid questionable circumstances. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. The superintendent of the Kansas Highway Patrol and his top assistant both resigned this week. Cakes Greg Miller and I dug into why. Colonel Mark Bruce and Lieutenant Colonel Randy Moon resigned Thursday. They served as the superintendent and assistant superintendent at the Kansas Highway Patrol and have been with the agency since the 1980s. In a news release, Governor Kelly simply said the two resigned, but her office wouldn't say why they suddenly left the Highway Patrol, calling it a personnel matter. But Cake News has learned that legislative leadership received this email last month from an anonymous author. It alleges that Bruce and Moon were involved in various acts of misconduct and even a cover-up from within the department. The Topeka Capital Journal reports that after requesting any police records involving Moon, it shows there was a claim of a domestic assault, but all the names in the report were redacted and no charges were ever filed. Late Thursday afternoon, the governor named Shawnee County Sheriff Herman Jones as the new superintendent, saying he's the right person for the job, quote, at this critical time. And there's still many details coming out about this. Here to help us understand what's going on, I'm joined by Representative Brandon Whipple, Democrat from Wichita, Dr. Neil Allen, uh, political analyst from Wichita State University, and Representative Troy Waymaster, a Republican from Bunker Hill. Thank, Thank you all you. so much. So this obviously still developing. We're still learning, learning many details. Well, I've spoken with some members in legislative leadership who have seen the emails. The general populace of the State House was not aware of this going over the last month. How is it hitting lawmakers as they're starting to find out? What do you, what, what's kind of the first reaction lawmakers are having? Uh, Troy, let's start with you. Well, I have to say back in um, December, I was actually glad that Governor Kelly had retained Colonel Bruce in the Kansas Highway Patrol. Um, I thought he had done a great job um, during your service in the Highway Patrol. However, since this story has uh, come to light, um, I, I'm trying to get all the facts. Um, like you said, it's kind of in the early stages, obviously, uh, perhaps le legislative leadership may have known about this. Obviously, Governor Kelly had known about some of the instances within the Kansas Highway Patrol. Um, but I think for the most part, uh, regular members of the legislature did not, uh, except for some of the stories that have been leaking out. But obviously, if there was some type of uh, cover up in regarding a domestic you know, abuse situation, um, obviously some circumstances needed to be addressed. Wow. Brandon? Uh, really, it's a developing story. Um, I am not one of the legislators who was privy to this information mm -hmm. before you know, the general public was. Uh, but, but I'll tell you, we have a no-nonsense governor. And if it's working, it works. And she was willing to, I, I think, uh, keep the people um, who are in place in place. But as, as soon as it, it, credibility comes to these, um, to, to these uh, uh, stories, uh, she's going to make sure she, that we have our house in order. Uh, so I'm glad that, you know, now that the story is developing, uh, our governor has put in place uh, people who, um, you know, can uh, lead the highway patrol uh, the way it should be led. Yeah. And, well, and uh, on that note, uh, Ashley All, the governor's uh, spokesperson, told the Wichita Eagle today that uh, Colonel Bruce and Lieutenant Colonel Moon had been put on administrative leave before they submitted their resignations and that those resignations are um, effective April 6th. So certainly kind of indicates that it was a immediate uh, disciplinary action. But this is not the first uh, personnel issue the governor has had. We had the situation with uh, the uh, appeals court justice uh, with, with the tweets that mm -hmm. were rather mm -hmm. um, obscene <laughs> with language and extremely partisan and um, a couple of other issues. Is this hurting the governor to have these personnel issues going on? Well, I mean, is I mean, Laura Kelly's brand is very much to be a competent and like Representative Whipple said, no nonsense administrator. Maybe that's also the Democratic Party talking points, but I think it works. It certainly works in, in Governor Kelly's favor when things seem to be running smoothly, particularly considering we had a lot of kinds of administrative difficulties during the Brownback administration. Although they are probably more so <laughs> because of lack of resources being put to state agencies. But also, government's got to hire people. 
And so all the kinds of human resources problems that any of us have in our jobs are going to occur in government service too. It's just that the issues of transparency are going to be more complicated and also the fact that while Laura Kelly is a boss of lots of people, her, also her boss is us, which complicates her kind of, her, gives her less freedom of maneuver and also creates all kinds of responsibilities that she has to, to try to balance as governor. Okay. Well, as you, we've all said, this is a still developing story, so we're going to leave it there. Maybe come back to it in a couple of weeks when we have more information. We're going to move on to some other topics today. There are worries mounting about school funding as lawmakers run late in responding to the Supreme Court's order to put more money into your child's education. Now, the House this week failed to pass a bill of its own, but hopes to hammer out a deal with the Senate next week. It's hard to do when we wait this late in the game. Uh, and we've had all session where we could have been addressing one of the most important issues. The senators are watching the House closely this week, worrying about timing. I just left the House of Representatives and uh, we'll see what they kind of come up with. The senators passed a school funding bill weeks ago, one most education groups say should satisfy the Kansas Supreme Court. Now it's up to the House and the House is looking at something completely different with funding for just two years instead of four and adding in several policy changes senators don't think will pass. But now we're really going to be way over time if we have a big fight over that. Our schools, our children, it does them a disservice. Um, also, I think that it, it, we're going to need to uh, address the issue of inflation even more. The Attorney General's office said it needed a funding plan by March 15th. That deadline has passed, and they still have to prepare for the next Supreme Court hearing. That puts the Attorney General's staff, whoever's going to argue the bill, it puts them at a disadvantage. They can't prepare their briefs. It, it puts them behind the eight ball. Uh, they stand to get uh, lectured by the Supreme Court on being late, and uh, I don't think it bids well for the overall climate. Now, one lawmaker, as we were working on that story, said uh, they're expecting the attorney general's office to come knocking on the statehouse door any moment going, where is our bill? <laughs> it is definitely an issue. And I know that uh, the House was looking at a bill, two extremely late night sessions, never quite got to debate, uh, my understanding, because leadership said they just didn't have the votes for it. But we do have a uh, conference committee going, which is where the House and the Senate send delegates and they sit down and hammer out a deal. What is the chance that they will get one done by April 6th, which is when the legislature is supposed to wrap up its business? Brandon, let's start with you this time. So the legislature is a lot like some of the students I see that teach at college, <laughs> where uh, you have all semester to work on a project, but you really don't see movement until the deadline <laughs> is almost there. Um, you know, with that said, uh, the House they're in conference with a bill that's mostly about policy. Um, and the Supreme Court has said your policy's okay. Uh, there's two points to the lawsuit, and I'm gonna really break it down. It's about policy and are you giving it enough money? Um, the court said you're very close to meeting the money part. All you have to do is adjust for inflation. The Senate bill adjusts for inflation. Uh, so whatever gets out of conference, I'm hoping uh, it's gonna be more about adjusting for inflation than it is coming up with some crazy new idea uh, on a, you know, a, that, that would drag out this court battle if we jump back into the policy part. Okay, Troy? You were correct in regards to, um, I think it's House Bill 2395, which was the bill that basically be the, the funding apparatus for K through 12 education. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there was the votes in the House. Mm -hmm. And that's why when it was supposed to be debated Monday night, um, it was pushed back until Tuesday, still couldn't garner the votes. And so we didn't debate that. And instead we debated Senate Bill 16. Um, which, as Brandon mentioned, um, pretty much contains a lot of the policy measures um, in regards to accountability towards K through 12 education, um, bullying prevention, um, other aspects that were included in, in Senate Bill 16. It is somewhat reminiscent of what I would say happened in, I think, 2014, where we had just a strictly funding bill that we sent over to the Senate, and then they added a lot of policy into it and then uh, eventually we took some of that policy out and then it passed. Now I did uh, receive a call from the uh, chairperson of the education committee in the Senate because uh, they wanted to use my committee room uh, for conference committee on Monday <laughs> and I, I allowed them to go ahead and use that. So I know they're gonna be starting early on Monday mm -hmm. in conference with uh, the Senate Bill 142 which was uh, very similar to the, what the governor had proposed uh, in her state of the state address and also in her budget 
in addressing the inflationary needs for K-12 education, um, and then also bill, uh, Senate Bill 16, uh, which passed the House, um, but uh, doesn't have any real funding mechanism behind it. It's just strictly policy. Yeah. Well, it's not unusual for if you can't reach a deal for the legislature to go home on that uh, April date, in this case, April 6th, and say, well, we'll deal with it in veto session, and then go long if necessary. But that's not really an option. They've got a Supreme Court imposed deadline this time. They're supposed to have briefs to the Supreme Court by April 15th. Are we facing a constitutional crisis? Well, you know, in Kansas now for years, we've kind of been dancing around the question of what is the Supreme Court going to do if the legislature does something different than what the court wants? And the legislature has not yet confronted the court directly. And um, is the Supreme Court actually going to go and, and order schools to, to close as of July 1 because the legislature is three weeks late in giving them a bill that will still fund things as of July 1? I'd be skeptical about that. Uh, and it, and it, I think the best way to understand the court's behavior the last few years is trying to put pressure on the legislature to go a certain direction. And it seems to have been successful, and they're just pushing it to go a little further. And, I mean, to expect a state legislature to hit a given deadline that is not the sunny day end deadline mm -hmm. or a deadline that somehow we're going to start running out of money is really not a way to get what you want. I mean, legislatures, when they deal with important things, tend to deal do them at the very last minute and often past the last minute. So we shouldn't, and when people say, well, they should have been doing this early on. Well, the work is so difficult because we gave them inconsistent instructions. The people of Kansas for the last few election cycles have been electing legislatures and governors on inconsistent platforms. And so, and the Supreme Court makes it even more difficult. So it's just gonna take a little bit longer. All right. Well, we'll have to wait and find out. This is not a, uh, argument that's going to go away anytime soon. No, We've been yeah, dealing with it for, for a few, few years now. Well, while lawmakers couldn't get school funding did, done, they did get quite a bit of other work done this last week. The House working dozens of bills Monday and Tuesday and going late into the night to finish. 37 bills in a single day. That was the goal for the Kansas House Monday, another 15 on Tuesday. Leadership says the number was necessary because of a looming deadline to get bills over to the Senate. By the time most lawmakers went home on Wednesday for a long weekend, the House had passed a bill that lowers the minimum age for concealed carry permits to 18. Another one that legalizes the possession of CBD oil with low levels of THC in it if one has a doctor's permission. They also approve the commercial sale of marijuana's cousin hemp used in making rope and cloth. Those bills are all on their way to the Senate now when lawmakers return next week. While the Senate is sending the House a bill that would add ordained clergy to the list of people required to report signs of child abuse to law enforcement and DCF. And those are all very big, very uh, controversial bills in some, some sense or another, um, or at least headline grabbing. <laughs> As you guys were working through all of these bills this last week, what were the ones that just kind of really stuck out for you that felt like this is going to make the biggest difference in the state? Troy? I would probably have to say the one that stuck out the most was uh, the one regarding CBD oil. And the reason why I, I reflect that is because I, I do have a constituent who has a young son um, and has been advocating um, for the ability to use CBD oil with limited you know, amounts of THC uh, because he has seizures. Um, and, and the other reason why I say that it was pro more of an impact um, as far as the debate, it was, it was very emotional. Um, there were legislators who shared very personal stories. Um, we also had um, individuals who were advocating for this, uh, not only in our calendar, when we go as the Republican caucus and discuss the bills, uh, but also they were in the gallery um, and were very uh, emotional um, when it got first round approval. Um, that was the one that really stuck out. It was, it was a lengthy debate, um, but I think well warranted. Um, it was a topic that has been lingering um, during our seven years at the State House. And, and I'm glad to see that we're moving in and having some progress in regards to that. The other is obviously um, addressing some of the agriculture needs across the state, especially in my area of the state. Last year we passed the industrial hemp bill um, and then this year, due to the changes in the Federal Farm Bill of 2018, we had to change some of the language in our statutes and make it a commercial hemp bill. Um, and I think that's going to have a great impact for our, our farmers and our producers. And actually, today, I, um, I sit on the advisory committee for the Industrial Hemp Program, 
And I remember just going through the applications uh, for the individuals that have applied with the Kansas Department of Agriculture for a hemp license in 2019. And with the passage of the commercial hemp bill, uh, that's going to change the aspect that we have in regards to hemp production in the state of Kansas. I understand a lot of people have applied for that uh, About license. About 300 applications yeah. we had to go through. And that was in regards to growers, processors, or distributors. Uh, but we're going through each and every one of the applications and seeing what type of a research level uh, they'll be looking at it for this first year. Um, if the uh, commercial hemp uh, production bill does pass, that'll alleviate a lot of those uh, extra questions that were asked on the application process and also lower the application fee for uh, the farmer or the grower, producer, or distributor. Okay. Brent? I'm in complete agreement uh, with um, Representative Waymaster. Uh, it's been very, as far as bills had the really big impacts on our state, mm -hmm. it's been very interesting to serve this uh, past few years and seeing the evolution of attitudes towards um, industrial hemp uh, and also uh, CBD oil uh, to treat seiz uh, seizures. Um, you know, we've had people when we first came in uh, who just couldn't tell the difference between hemp and marijuana or uh, CBD oil and marijuana um, that, that can actually get you high. Uh, mm -hmm. C CBD oil in this uh, form really can't get an adult high. Um, and hemp uh, doesn't have THC or uh, levels that actually <laughs> yeah. can cause problems. Uh, so seeing just the evolution of that over the years to the point now where uh, we, we're uh, passing these bills, uh, it's, it really uh, uh, shows the progress. Yeah. All right. Well, one thing we know is that there is one bill that it is in a little bit of trouble right now. Governor Laura Kelly issued her first veto Monday on a tax bill she says would send Kansas back to the crippling budget deficits of a few years ago. This bill would separate Kansas tax laws from federal tax laws, so Kansans can itemize their taxes at the state level again, as well as cut corporate taxes on companies that do business overseas and lower grocery sales taxes by 1%. The governor announced the veto from her ceremonial office Monday afternoon, just moments after issuing it. Kelly has been against the bill since the beginning of the session. Her veto, no surprise to anyone. Supporters of the bill are already mobilizing for a veto override, they say it's a de facto tax increase on Kansans and Kansas businesses that the state can't afford. The governor says it would leave the state in debt again. Unlike my budget, which left a healthy, fiscally responsible ending balance, the Senate budget, should I sign Senate Bill 22, will leave a deficit of more than $600 million within two years. That is unacceptable. That is irresponsible. We're starting a trend. This was the first bill that we passed to lower sales tax on food, and we're hoping to lower it further in the future. We have a problem in Kansas. Kansans are overtaxed. She should not have vetoed this bill. The Senate president indicated they will try to override the governor's veto and accuse the governor of violating her campaign promise not to raise taxes. The governor remains confident she has the votes to stop an override. Now, I, I know, Troy, you said you voted for SB 22, so I'm going to start with you on this. Can the veto be overridden? I think it's going to be very difficult for the veto to be overridden. Um, I think there was 74 votes in favor and final action in the House. You would have to find 10 more, um, and uh, that'd be very difficult. Uh, even back when we were talking about uh, the override in 2017, uh, at one point we had to find two. No. And uh, that was the first override that was uh, given, gone to the House, and you couldn't find two votes for that. Um, I, I don't think you're going to be able to find the votes to override um, Governor Kelly's veto on Senate Bill 22. Yeah. How big of an issue is veto override fights going to be for Governor Kelly, Neil? Well, I think it has to be because, I mean, she's a Democratic governor that's facing a legislature that is dominated by Republicans. But, of course, this is Kansas, so we have a lot of different kinds of Republicans in the legislature. And in some ways, I think this is a useful thing, that it, it, it'll it force legislators to, to, to set out where they are on issues of taxation. And um, especially considering, you know, these issues are somewhat different than the issues we had in the Brownback era. And, frankly, the, they're of less mo momentous importance. And also, I mean, it's, you know, politicians are always trying to figure out the, you know, who's got influence, who's got power. 
And so it'll be, it'll be a good test of whether or not um, Governor Kelly can hold all her Democrats behind her, which I think she probably can on this mm -hmm. one, and also can get the kind of defections from the Republican ranks that we've been used to seeing in the last few years. Okay, we'll have to wait and see. Now, in other news, the Barton County Sheriff says drugs have always been an issue there, but as the problem grows, he's finding new ways to tackle it. KSN News' Michelle Ross shows us how. Well, they had 11 of them. And that's a lot for Great Bend. Lifelong Barton County resident Trudy Richardson says she enjoys her walks outside, but recently she's become more cautious. If I walk, I don't walk too far. Richardson says the drug bust that happened Monday wasn't shocking. No, it's not a surprise. Barton County Sheriff's Department arrested 11 people. Sheriff Brian Bellandier says they executed search warrants at five locations and discovered meth, marijuana and drug paraphernalia. For us, you know, in Barton County, uh, 11 people getting arrested in one shot is a pretty substantial number. Since 2013, the county has conducted more major drug operations than in the past 15 years. He says the department has been more proactive with its new detective division and the use of social media as an additional tool. It's amazing what people will put on their Facebook accounts. Bellandier says it's a supply and demand issue. He says his department is doing everything it can to stop it. Putting the squeeze on them and we're making them take notice that this is not the county to be dealing dope in. Bellandier says he will not start another operation, but any further information will be the start of phase two. He expects more arrests will be made. Here for you in Barton County, Michelle Ross, KSN 3. And uh, Troy, uh, I'm going to come to you because you are from Western Kansas. Yes, uh, and, actually very close to Barton County. <laughs> and, and I know that uh, throughout Western Kansas especially, there has been a growing issue with uh, drug use and the drug trade. What are you hearing from sheriffs in your district? Well, and this is not a new issue. Um, like I mentioned, I live probably about eight, ten miles away from the Russell Barton County line. And so what you saw a lot when farmers were using anhydrous uh, years ago, many more farmers using anhydrous, you had this, this prolific problem with methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. And you had either individuals coming over and somehow extracting the anhydrous ammonia out of the, the tanks and then using that for a drug purpose. Um, it's a problem and it's been a problem for many years. And I think the Barton County Sheriff is just now finally finding a new way of trying to address the issue that has been lingering in uh, counties in central and western Kansas for quite some time now. Yeah. Is there anything uh, the legislature can do to help them? Um, really right now I, I can't think of anything that the legislature <laughs> yeah. can do. The laws are out there that these are illegal substances. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, I really don't know what else we can do to uh, try to assist the sheriff's departments in locating individuals who you know, may be uh, using these products. I, I don't know if there's any legislative action that can okay. be done. Well, there is what? one though. I mean, that, I mean, there are two, I mean, that this bus had two different drugs there. One was amphetamine and one was marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I think you would find a, a large majority of Kansans would support amphetamine still being made illegal. But when you're talking about marijuana, I'm not sure where the Kansans are anymore on that. Uh, it, there's, yeah. there's still a lot of Kansans who actually don't want to have it, have it be a recreational drug. All right. Well, that's an ongoing debate in the legislature. We'll have to touch on it another day. We have one more story to get to. Drug problems certainly fueling this. The prison crisis at El Dorado continues with a major staffing shortage. This week, KSN's Craig Andrus got an exclusive look behind the prison walls. Warden Sam Klein offered KSN an invitation to see all of El Dorado Correctional. We started out with an interview where he talked about being 89 officers short and what he calls very low pay for the job of corrections officer. Pay is an issue. I can tell you today that when an officer comes to work at El Dorado Correctional Facility, the day he signs on, he's eligible for food stamps. And I think that's an embarrassment to the state of Kansas that a state employee cannot make a living wage for a family. They say they're critically short-staffed, so officers work up to 16 hours a day, so they put cots into male and female rooms if someone is too tired to drive home. If you want to lay down, catch a power nap, you can. Moving into the cell blocks, we were allowed to stop anyone in sight and talk and found a common theme. Not enough staff, and it is stressful. It wasn't this bad when I started, and it just progressively gets worse. So yes, I am, I'm concerned about that. How so? Um, for my safety, for my co-worker's safety. Next, we moved on into the max part of the facility. 
This is maximum security and you're right in the middle of it. It's a gym that's not being used by cell block A. Those inmates are in their cells right now 21 hours a day because of what the warden calls threats to staff. Again, we stopped officers as we walked and asked about overtime and the long hours. Work a lot of hours? Yeah. Um, I usually work one of my days off. We get three days off right now with the uh, 12 hour shifts and then I'll do a 16 or two um, in there with it to make some extra money. Then it's on into cell block A that is on limited movement toward the long hours, turning out to be stressful to those who work here. Greeted by constant noise, the warden engages some of the inmates who are spending an hour out of their cell. People are going to see changes, but it begins by being compliant and working with us. Inmates say they're in their cells far too long. They tell me the warden says it's because of those threats and they have to earn back privileges. Again, those working in the line in A block say it can be a bundle of stress. It's a stressful environment. Sometimes they don't want to lock down, but you no, know, you got to do a job. Upping pay and having more staff, the warden says, would decrease tensions and increase safety for all at the prison. My job as warden of this prison is to limit that risk as best I can with the resources that remain. And a big thank you to KSN News for sharing that and other stories with us. Now, that was certainly the first look I've had behind the scenes of what's going on. We've had many stories about the conditions in El Dorado. As lawmakers, obviously you guys have been talking about this. Uh, budgeting been a big issue. Very Does this change or alter your perspective on the budget needs for the state uh, correction department? Well, I think the entire correctional system needs to have uh, be completely addressed. Um, pay is one of those. Um, obviously in the El Dorado facility, um, we did some pay increases in the last couple of years. It's not enough um, and that goes uh, through the system, system wide. We need to address our correctional officers and, and pay them. Uh, right now a, a, a adequate, or adequate wage comparable to the surrounding states. Uh, we have a Norton facility that is just right by the Nebraska border and they can go work in a facility in Nebraska and get paid uh, a few dollars more yeah. an hour. Uh, right. We need to address it system wide. And actually, um, we had a, some members had a meeting with the Secretary of Corrections and a plan that is moving forward. One of the aspects of that plan is to address correctional officer pay. Um, the other issue is we need to look at our facilities. Yeah. Um, right. themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that'll be something that certainly doesn't go away. Brandon, Neil, Troy, thank you so much for joining me this week. We are out of time as always. I'm sure I'll see you all again, and we'd love to continue the discussion on social media. Just look for KPTS Channel 8 or Pilar Pedraza TV. For now, have a great week.